Uh, we started yesterday with a, a parable. Um, here's uh, Aesop uh, reminding us that there is a danger that we can give way to others. And I think I want to sharpen the saw a little bit there and suggest that there are others um, whom some people are feeling fearful of and under pressure of giving way to. And I think we have to, we talked about assessment, but less about accountability. I think we have to recognise that what is valued ultimately at the subject level is hugely influenced by league tables and Ofsted. And I think it would be disingenuous not to have, although the EBAC debate is technically dead, it's not actually dead. And I would like to bring it into the room because I think there are real restrictions, at least in the intelligent mindsets of intelligent leaders in schools, about the legitimacy of some of the arts and some of the humanities and definitely many of the practical and vocational subjects. So I think that should be in the room. Uh, I wonder if I could have a second slide, please, and just quickly click through the things that will come onto it and leave them as a background. I think um, when uh, we talk about expansive education, um, I I'd like to use Ron Richard's words to remind us what I think we might be asking, and I'm really going to be asking more questions than offering answers. He asked this question, what if education were less about acquiring skills and knowledge and more about cultivating the dispositions and habits of mind that students will need for a lifetime of learning, of problem solving? and decision making? What if education were less concerned with the end of year exam and more concerned with who students become as a result of their schooling? What if we viewed smartness as a goal that students can work toward rather than as something they either have or don't? I'll say three quick things about the three things up there in a second. But we're talking about principled curriculum design. Dylan, whose pamphlet has been mentioned already, um, defines Curriculum, um, and, and, or at least uses the default de de description of curriculum as the educational experiences that are planned for learners in educational settings. And uh, I want to just take issue two with the word planned, because I think we have to recognise that there's a... Who are the actors here? We had uh, really good examples yesterday in many of the workshops I was part of where I could see that students were genuinely co-planning what was being learned. Are they part of the curriculum debate? Yes, of course they are. Uh, and Guy gave an indication of their, their willingness to, or their exercise of a suggestion that, that self-defence might be on their curriculum. So planned by whom? At the moment, many curricula are planned by timetable designers. They therefore default to the one-hour units of delivery that Susan was talking about. Why are we doing that? It seems to me bonkers. There seems to be very little educational justification for having a principled decision that ends up with a fragmented diet, whether you reduce the movement around the school or not. Although we, of course, need to hear the different epistemologies, the different subject disciplines, which are going to sit there, because subjects are indeed still the unit of the curriculum. More of that in a second. Um, I think we should reflect too on not just the planned, but the unplanned experiences of school. When the Nelson Mandela life is celebrated, whilst we may have feared that was going to happen in the near future, that's an unplanned event in the school. But any principled curriculum designer is shifting to the design of the curriculum in the moment. And that would be within the curriculum, extracurricular, hidden curricula, informal curricula, the messages and meanings, to be more semiotic about it, that young people extract from the complex thing called going to school. But it won't stop there either, because another actor, as the CBI is urging us to take more seriously, are parents. And we had lots of conversations about that yesterday. What role do parents have in thinking about the valued outcomes of curricula? The CBI makes a very interesting call in its publication of about this time last year, arguing that as well as a debate about the national curriculum and what matters, we need a national debate about the kinds of attributes and dispositions and capabilities that we want to see in young people. Here, here. So is it the same thing? Is it enough to say that we need, in Tim's phrase, as well as we need knowledge as well as pedagogy or whatever you want to counterpoise to that, or knowledge as well as capabilities. I'm not sure it quite is. Because if our 
doorway into the thinking of this is through knowledge, it tends to produce a different result than if, as in Australia, our doorway, our entry point, is through the, the notion of capabilities. Because the question that arises from the first is, first of all, which knowledge? And then, secondly, how can we teach all these other things that attend to and accrue to and are the kind of affordances of those knowledge systems? Whereas in Australia, the question is, which capabilities do we want guys' imaginary 19-year-olds to emerge with? And then how can we construct a curriculum that doesn't necessarily have to distribute itself in 25 equal globules across the week? That's a different question. And I want to end with a series of questions which I believe we might be wanting to have better answers to if we're really going to design a principled curriculum. How can we ensure that all learners acquire growth mindsets and therefore challenge the notion that uh, ability is fixed and expand that notion? How can we make activities as authentic and, and, and as engaging as possible? And at the same time, we're expanding learners' horizons. So we don't just teach mathematics through instrumental computations at supermarkets. How can we make inquiry and questioning? And this is where I think it really unites the role of teachers as learners and reflectors and learners as questioners and inquirers. How can we make inquiry and questioning a central feature of all that we do? Not just what's good for children, but what's good for the adults who look after those children. How can we ensure that we offer learners, learners the best blend of theoretical explanation and practical experience? That's not easy, but it's a real question when it comes to principled curriculum design. How can we create opportunities for learners to go deeper? Maybe those are the wild experiences that David Perkins alludes to. Become immersed and strive for excellence. That would take us into the ethic of excellence that writers like Ron Berger talk about curricula needing to imbue in young people. How can we organise classes in ways that actively encourage students to see themselves as part of a community or a studio or a workshop and make best use of available resources without waiting for the teacher? How can we develop patterns of collaborative learning so that learners are well equipped to learn, play, play, enjoy, work together with others in a variety of contexts? Nearly there. How do we ensure the processes of learning are explicit and that the language we use to describe them is well understood by all? That's part of a curriculum entitlement, isn't it? That young people will be able to understand how they are learning and talk about and reflect on that process. Penultimately, how can we make best use of face-to-face -face time and also harness the resources of the virtual curriculum out there? How can we do that? And finally, how can we best facilitate the development of all learners in all of our classes? That's the point that Susan was making. And final uh, slide, if I could, please. Mark Twain mischievously reminds us that we only really consider principles when we're safely well-bellied. And I just wonder, I find in the work that we do with teachers and head teachers and those working with schools, that even confident, successful, fully grown up adults have a sense of fear about them at the moment. And even if they're not actually underfed, they're feeling distinctly emotionally underfed. And I think we need to watch it at the moment because I'm not sure we're in quite such benign waters as Tim's elegant and lucid presentation led us to believe. Thank you.